this should be relevant for anyone who works in post excavation really this next bit so just while i think about it i'll show you a couple of quick things that sort of help you navigate your project so let's say i i've ended up going over here um and i want to go back to my site you can go right click zoom to layers and there you go it snaps straight back to it so that's I use that all the time so i've turned off everything else i've just got my um, ordnance survey stuff and my site uh, and i'm going to load in a ah yes this is another way of loading things in you can navigate to where it is um, and then you can just like drag it in so this is an example of a survey file that isn't quite finished yet so you just dragged it into the empty bit like that um, so this is a different file type this is dxf which is an output from for example autocad so if your surveyors are working in cad but you want to have a look at what they're doing you can have a little peek by loading it into gis and you don't have to have an autocad um, license which is very expensive so it will ask me which elements of it I want to load in and I want both of those things I'm just going to make sure it knows definitely national grid national grid lovely uh, I'm going to turn this off for a second just so that we can see that's our point data but you can have a look here we've got all the stuff that's going on so we've got you know, some things that are slightly unresolved at the moment because this is survey in progress. Um, and I'm going to right click and bring up my layer styling panel again. Get rid of identify results, don't need that currently. So what it's done is it has brought it in with embedded symbols, which is something that can happen if you have a DXF. So that might be the way that the surveyors like to look at it. And so that means it's automatically all coloured and styled. But if you wanted to manually change it, you can change it to categorised. And then the value you probably want layer. So those are the layers that they have in CAD. Uh, yes, uh, it's different to those classifications. There we go. Uh, and then that's given us some crazy colours and then you can change them as demonstrated. The way that the surveyors at my unit do it is that they have the labels kind of as points out here. So we can go single labels and then we don't want layer, we want actually text. So that is the text of the label. So you can see that you have the feature numbers and the cut numbers. So another nice quick way to um, navigate your project is, OK, I wanted to have a look at um, feature, I'm just going to, you can sort this, there we go. So I wanted to have a look at feature number 3110, where is that? So when you're in your attribute table, you can click on it and then you can right click, zoom to feature, much like zoom to layer. And there we go, and it's highlighted it yellow, that's the one we're looking at. Alternatively, if you want to go, okay, I want to find out what the feature numbers are for this entire bit of the site, let's say. We're on our labels and then we, we can use, sorry, I didn't say, the um, select features by area and we can draw a box like this. It will highlight everything in yellow and then we go back into our attributes and then instead of show all features, we can change it to show selected features. And there we go. It just lists the ones that we've highlighted. So, for example, if you're working with um, finds and you've got your small find numbers, you, you know, they've been surveyed in. You want to have a look at that against the site. You need to find where a particular small find was. You can you can search for it basically like this. Uh, another thing that you can do is as you can see here I've got the feature numbers but I've also got the cut numbers maybe I don't want to show all of those things a nifty thing that is explained to a much further extent in the workbook that you will have access to when we 
give you the QR code, um, is that you can filter. So I want to filter the text, and I've written this out. So you get you. This is demonstration. Don't worry. It is explained much more thoroughly in the workbook. But you can go. Okay, the fields I'm looking at are text. So I double click that, and then one of the things that you might want to use is I like. So it's like the text contains this thing. And then in this example, I'm saying, I only want to filter it to the feature numbers. So they all start with F. This is a wild card, so that means it can have anything after the F. Close your thing, test it. Whoa, that was loud. Uh, <laughs> there you go, that seems about right. Okay, okay. And now it has filtered it, so we don't have the cut numbers anymore. We only have the feature numbers showing. And there are so many use cases for that. Um, so that means, again, you're not deleting this information from your shapefile. It is just how it is displaying in your project. So now I'm going to load in the finished survey for the file. So I'm not interested in in progress anymore. The surveyors have gone over everything. I'm going to make this quieter, I think. Is that it? That's it. There we go. Um, surveyors are done. They've sorted out all the issues. You know, maybe you had it up on your screen and then you could speak to them in the office or maybe you could annotate it. Um, but now they're done. Let's load it in. So our surveyors, we they've done it by separate shapefiles like this. So we have all the different things. So we've got the basis of slope, the edges of the features, which are lines, the polygons for the features. Um, we've already got our LOE, that's fine. Modern and slots. Let's load them all in. Just drag them in and give it a second. There we go. I will set the CRS to be, yep, that is British National Grid. And then I'll move the LOE at the top. And so, yeah, we'll want the base of slope sitting on top of the polygons. And you can start, you know, styling things how you want. Obviously, you want the slots on top as well. In this example, I think the feature edges aren't as important, so... Sorry, when you're dra dragging it up, does that just mean that it's... Sure. Yeah, it's changing the order of the layers. So the things that are at the top will be sitting on top of... Sorry, I didn't explain that. You're quite right. Um, so, yeah, so they don't get... Obs the one at the top won't be obscured by anything else. Um, so, again, we've got our automatic crazy colours, but for the purposes of the demonstration, that's not really a problem. So what's nice now is that we don't have the labels as points that are separate from the polygons instead when we go okay what feature is this identify we have our feature number right there um, so we can use that to add labels and be able to see but we can also you know go okay i really wanted to find feature number 3239 oh that was pan to feature pan to feature works as well but zoom to feature close it you can see the benefits of using two screens while you're using GIS, by the way. That's what I always do. I always have the uh, attribute tables in another one. Yeah, and then we can see what we're looking at. There you go, yellow. Uh, and that means that you can start to see the, uh, the interactions between the different features on your site um, much more easily than trying to flip between different context sheets and having a look at the sketches and you know you can actually just see it in front of you and you can zoom in and you can interrogate it and all of that but what's really great is that you can phase it like i demonstrated before or you can load in your phasing information that you've already done in a spreadsheet or maybe you've even got it in a database in the workbook or a file supplied with the workbook, I'll explain how you can join QGIS with an access database so it will keep talking to it. But in this demonstration, I'm going to show you um, a comma separated value, which is the kind of stripped down version of a spreadsheet 
it just has the data and no kind of styling or anything like that. It's really stripped down, so they're nice small files, easy to edit and open in anything you like, really. Um, but they're really good for this. So maybe you've already done this in your um, Excel spreadsheet. So we've got our feature numbers and we've got our phases and also we've got type. You know, you might want that information as well. So this is an Excel spreadsheet. What you will do is save it as a um, where are we now? CSV. Save. And when you save a CSV, it can only do one sheet. So it's just telling me now one sheet. That's the only sheet that I want currently. So what's really clever about this is that instead of just adding that information to your shape file, you're actually joining the information. So it means that it's still talking to it. First, we need to add that information to our project. It doesn't have any spatial information. That's fine. We just need it to be able to talk to it. So slightly confusingly, instead of saying CSV, it says delimited text layer. Sorry, that's slightly counterintuitive, but that's what it is. There we go, CSV. Uh, so if you have a uh, lat long, for example, in your grid, if you're importing information from somewhere else, you can set that to have, okay, it's got point coordinates and, you know, X is this, Y is this, for example. In this one, we don't have that, no geometry, add, and then it has it just here. So we can't see it because it's not connected to the spatial information yet, but now we will connect it. So feature polygon, properties, joins, and then we add it here. So the join layer, we want this one, the CSV, so the join field and the target field, you want these to be the same piece of information. So the feature and the feature number, and they have to be in the same format, otherwise it won't talk to each other properly. So it's quite important to match that correctly. And then we can decide which fields we want to add. So we actually do want to add both type and phase probably because they're both relevant. And then we can change the prefix. So we get new columns on our attribute table. Um, and then I quite like to put just CSV underscore. So I know that that information is from the CSV and it's not in the shape file itself. Okay, apply. All right. And now we can see that it has added this information. So we've got the type from the CSV and the phase from the CSV. And we can now style the layer, categorized, phase, classify, just turn off the other gump. And there we go, we have random colors applied to our base. But that's okay because you can organize these in phase order and then you can apply color ramp. Obviously I haven't moved them into order but it would be too boring for you to watch me do it. But assuming that I have, then you can quite easily sort of zoom in and look at the colors and go, okay, so the darker colors are meant to be later than the lighter colors. Are they overcutting them? Has something funny gone on with the survey here? or maybe we've got things that are undated. So for example, all other we'd go, you know, let's change it to a, a light gray. Then we can see, okay, that's not dated, but it's not really connected to anything, so I don't know. But then, you know, something down here, ooh, maybe that's just a butting, but something might be cut by something else and then that will help you narrow down some of the phasing. So here we go this one, that definitely looks earlier than early to middle Roman, for example. So we can save our thing and then we want to make some changes to our CSV. 
So we open, open the CSV. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, OK, which one was this? This was 3113, right? I'm going to close that. Oh, yes, it's asking me about my scratch layer, which is the, dip, the buffered one, but I don't need that anymore. So, yes, I am going to just ditch it. That's one of my scratch layers. 3113. It's not there. That's why I didn't have a face. 3113. That looked like a ditch to me. And then it was earlier than early to middle Roman. So let's say, you know, the, the material you found in there implied that, but you weren't quite sure. E, e rom. Lovely. Save. And that saved on our CSV. So then when we reload, it should now have updated that information because it's joined. It's not imported. It's, it's joined information. There we go. It now has a colour. Uh, so that's that can aid you in um, updating your spreadsheets and stuff. And yeah, it does need to be a CSV unless you're using a database and you link it with the database. You can also use this to then go, OK, well, I want to start grouping my, um, my features. So that looks like a sunken feature building to me. So I'm going to use select features. I'm going to highlight them. I'm going to go into the attribute folder, turn on editing. Now we don't have groups here yet, so I'll make a new thing. Group, text string, make it nice and long in case we need to have something very descriptive. And then instead of show all features, we have show selected features. Now we could type it in each time, but we also have multi-edit mode. Click that, and then that means that the thing that you type in, that will change for all of the things that were selected. So let's say SFB1, apply changes. Then we go back into this view. We can see they're all SFB1, but all of the other information is still there. Show all features. And yeah, those are the only ones that have been changed. Save. Untoggle editing. And so then that means that you can also use categorized colors by group. So you can more easily see you know, what, what's grouped and what isn't. And you can have different colors for the groups and things like that. Yeah, if you have another, another spreadsheet that has the group information on, you can also join that as another CSV if you want to. Um, so you would go to properties, joins, and then just add another one. You can, you can add and delete your joins here as needed. Uh, and then you can also, the information that you put in here instead of on a CSV, of course, you can open that into Excel and save that as a spreadsheet as well if you need to. Um, and then just on the end of this demonstration, I'm going to show you creating some information from scratch just to demonstrate the kind of drawing tools, I suppose. So. I'm going to change this back to single symbol and have it a bit darker than that so we can see what's going on. So you might have like some gaps that maybe things didn't, um, the surveyor didn't join up in the field or something, something happened. Um, maybe it was truncated by something, but you're, you know, you're going, nah, this really is the rest of the feature. So we can go, okay, let's have a look. That's three, two, two, three, two, zero, zero. Lovely. So we can make a new file, a new shape file with all of our sort of like um, gaps. So that means that you're not overwriting the shape file with the true survey that was done on site. 
this is information that you're adding, um, so you're not making it look like it was surveyed in, in the first place. So we're making a layer from scratch. So instead of adding a layer, we create a layer and we create a shapefile layer. Shapefiles are usually what you'll be using in QGIS. So we'll make it Um, this site was broom 19, you know, you want your project code, something like that. Um, gaps, for example. Don't worry about the file encoding. So this is where we're talking about the, you know, the types of vector data. So yeah, the no geometry is like the CSV that we brought in, but we do have geometry. We want the geometry and we want it polygon. And we want it to be British National Grid. And then here is where you edit the things that go into the attributes table. So by default, it has ID and just a number, but actually we probably want feature nut because that's how they've written it there. Uh, we want it to be, yeah, text, and we want it to, nah, we can have a number actually, can't we? Yeah, it's a number, okay add to field list, and then I'm just going to get rid of ID. And then I'm also going to add comment in case we need any comments, text data, you know, make that nice and long, add to field list. Okay. So now we've got this uh, new layer that we're making. I'm just going to bring that to the top so it doesn't get obscured by anything. Oh, I wouldn't anyway. Um, Again, editing is off by default, so we need to turn it on. And we're making a, um, a shape from scratch. So um, your toolbox looks like different to mine. Ah, oh, there it is. Add polygon feature. This is something you can have turned on and off as well, is the snapping, snapping toolbar. As there's information here I actually want to snap to, I'm going to turn that on. So this little magnet, that means that when your cursor is hovering near something that's probably going to be useful, it will kind of magnetically go to that rather than put it sort of somewhere nearby. Because it might look right until you zoom in and then you realise it's quite far away. So let's turn on our snapping. There you go, it's giving me this little box, so I know it's going to snap to that corner. Nice, going to snap to that, lovely, lovely, right click, and then we had feature number 3200, and then if you want to put in your comments, maybe it was truncated. Okay. And then you can also, um, like I did before, copy the styles. and then paste them so that it looks the same. So you can more easily see if something's done or not. So that's a polygon and I'll just demonstrate also, save, come off here. You might want some lines. So you might want kind of lines showing the continuity of things as you're marking them up. Um, so you might want to imply that the that these this is a continuation of that. So we go layer, create layer, oops, new shapefile layer. And I'm gonna call that continuation lines. So this time we want line string. Again, we want British National Grid. Maybe you want comment, text data, add that, remove that. So again, you toggle editing, and then you can see this icon's changed now to be add line feature instead of add polygon feature. You might want this to snap or you might not, you can turn that on and off, but let's go here to here. Right click, OK, here to here, right click, 
Okay. And then just as another demonstration of styling, I would probably have it as a simple line, but have it probably black and then have it as a dashed line. So then it renders like that. And then, yeah, the points are basically the same principle, really. Um, it's just one click and then it comes up with a thing immediately, what you want to type in for the information. Uh, and there are tools like um, you can make um, circles if you you click and then sort of drag how big you want the circle and that, that sort of thing. So there, there are lots of options to make it easy for you. I'm just going to turn this off. Um, to draw and add information to your annotations or your extra bits of information or anything like that. Um, so I think that is pretty much my demonstration. Um, did you want to demonstrate a couple of...? Um, I think what I'd like to do is just highlight for everybody the key things you need to remember to look for. So bottom right hand corner you see ESPG 27700. That's the that's the code for British National Grid. And um, that's something you need to make sure to check. Um, also, another key feature is plugins. So one fantastic thing about QGIS is that it's open source, which means that a lot of people contribute different plugins and different tools. So Ellie mentioned earlier that she, write, she wrote a, code, a string of Python in order to perform a task. But if you're like me and you can't, I can't even I can't even tolerate Python. It confuses me so much. Very clever people have created these tools for you. So, for example, say you were trying to look for postcodes on GIS. Postcodes are, uh, while they are very useful spatial tools for us in the UK, aren't very useful for a lot of people. So there's no inherent built-in postcode finder in QGIS. But someone very clever has, in fact created a zoom to postcode python tool and you can just install it and then you can you can use it in your uh, project whenever you wish there's plenty of things to do this so for example you've got your zoom to postcode you've got your what three words tool another fantastic example of a different type of spatial data being input being integrated into um GIS. There's also things like freehand geograph geo uh, raster georeferencer. So I showed you that map of Coheath in my presentation earlier. I used the georeferencer to basically take a screenshot of that map. Nothing fancy. Didn't even download it. I just screenshotted it, and I I manipulated it onto the map to line up with the field boundaries and the roads. And hey presto, it's georeferenced. Easy peasy. So that's a really easy way to do that, and you can literally just manipulate it with tools. There are other ways to georeference, but um, they will be covered in the booklet or um, there's fantastic tools online. Um, considering that it is open source and there are a lot of people contributing to it, there are situations you'll find there'll be, there'll be bugs, it will crash. However, um, Ellie mentioned forums. There are loads of really fantastic forums you can tap into for improving your QGIS knowledge and skill. One really, really, really good one is Stack Exchange for geographic information systems. I would really recommend doing that. Everybody on that forum is very friendly. And honestly, I put weird, like silly little questions in and they answer them immediately. They're fantastic. So there's some really fantastic forums. QGIS also has a manual. It can be a bit tricky to understand, but the more you learn about QGIS, the easier it is, the easier it is to understand the language and the rubric that kind of goes with it. So um, essentially in summary for me and Ellie today, we want to we wanted to run the session so that we would promote QGIS use, GIS use amongst archaeologists and prove that actually it's not that scary. It's really useful. And um, as we said before, it's a really, really marketable skill. We have a workbook for you. So if you scan this uh, QR code with your phones, um, tap the link, it will take you to a Google form. If you fill your um, contact in information out, so it's just an email, um, please let us know, um, please give us your email and what we'll do is we're just going to bulk send it out to anybody who wants it. So tell your friends, share this link with them, any, any email we get, um, any email we collect, we'll just send it out and it'll probably be by the end of the week.
yeah. I presume. But once you've got the workbook and the, the tools associated with it, share far and wide because, you know, we created this, we've run this program with session because we are, we want to promote the use of it where possible. You know, we are part of those big GIS nerds who make plugins and uh, talk about it on forums. That That's what we love. That's what we love about it. So please do uh, take the workbook. It's got step-by-step -step instructions, including screenshots. The um, video will be available on the CIFA website and the we're hoping to get the, the workbook and associated files up there as well. But um, other than that, uh, that's, that's probably it for us. So thank you very much.